webinar live and Senator Bray has joined us. Uh, this is a joint meeting of Senate Finance and Senate Appropriations. And we're here, Tom Covett uh, did the revenue report um, yesterday for the e-board. And normally we would have had him into both committees for a half hour or so, an hour in the afternoon. But we thought, because this year has been so extraordinary, that it might be better if we had a longer period of time. I know my committee was very interested in, do we know, are there winners and losers in this whole COVID change in the economy? What do we know at this point? What don't we know? Um, so Tom, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Ann. Um, I don't know if everyone was in on the emergency board meeting. I, I don't want to be redundant. I know some of you have heard this two or three times already. Okay, I see some heads shaking. If you were at the emergency board meeting, raise your hand. So not too many. Yeah, just a few. Okay, great. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, it'll be redundant for some, but I'll sort of go through uh, general things. But I do want to leave uh, time for Q&A. And uh, so, uh, although we have a lot of time, it looks like, so I don't think that'll be a problem, but I'll, I'll, I'll just uh, give sort of a, a quick review uh, and background. Uh, there are still two things that are driving the, the state economy and state revenues. And those two things are the epidemiological path of the pandemic and the extraordinary federal fiscal and monetary responses to that. Uh, uh, to the pandemic. And, and both of them are unprecedented and, and enormous in size. So the effects on the economy can be a kind of whipsawing uh, uh, effect where you have uh, enormous declines early on that were pandemic related, and then enormous jumps and spikes in various areas that are related to a federal response the likes of which we've never seen before, both in terms of speed and magnitude. So uh, when we did the, the uh, forecast in August, which is the last official forecast that budgets were based on, we had a couple of months of actual tax data, uh, but it was quite muddled it, uh, uh, because of a, a bunch of moratoria that existed for some of the consumption taxes deferrals that were being allowed, and then a an, uh, uh, filing deadline extension uh, that, that moved things <laughs> into July. And then a post office that was still delivering in August mail that was postmarked before July 15th. So there, there were just a combination of things that, that made things quite unclear. It was clear that there were steep declines in places. Uh, it was clear that there was some offset that was occurring, but very little of that offset was showing up uh, in tax revenues. And a lot of it, uh, when you traced it through, uh, uh, initially was tax exempt. So all the PPP money, for example, the Paycheck, Paycheck Protection Program money was, mm -hmm. was tax free. Um, but the expenditures that were made with it, whether it's for payroll, or for uh, uh, other business expenses uh, gave rise to taxable events that, that occurred downstream from it. Um, and and there, there is a, a little cartoon, uh, uh, Senator Sears, on page eight. It's, you know, it's a joke, but it's, it's the way the economy works. And it's a picture of a mother who's, you know, who's, who's homeschooling her child and and the child says, mom, I, need, I, I know you're working, but I need help with math. How soon will your stimulus money trickle down to buy me a new Lego set? And <laughs> it's, it's that spending, it's that, you know, money comes in. The first thing that happened, you know, and lots of different kinds of money comes in, but, you know, the, the unrestricted money that was sent was just $1,200 per person for a taxpayer with a, a, a additional money for children. Uh, you know, that, that lands, the first thing it did was it shot the savings rate way up. 
So uh, there, there's um, uh, also a chart on that you'll see in the uh, uh, presentation on page 18, but it, it, the savings rate spiked to over 30%, and it's almost never higher than 15%. Uh, it's back down to about 15% as of November, but that's higher than it's been at any time in the last 40 years. And the, and the 33% that it hit is higher than it's ever been at any time. So this money poured in and sort of like as if the whole water table of the state rose, uh, the springs that were you know, flowing a little bit started gushing and springs that nobody knew were there started popping up. And uh, uh, some of that economic flow of money ends up being taxable and gives rise to uh, revenues that we started seeing in the first six months of fiscal 21 that were consistently above target and also were, were quite widespread. So we take these apart and try to look if, if there are single events that are driving things. Very often, if there's a, a big jump in revenues, we go back and we'll find a, a processing issue or something, you know, some big event that's kind of a one-time event or something like that that explains it. This was not uh, explicable by any, any of those sorts of things. It was very broad-based. It was showing up in, in personal income, in corporate, in sales and use, in motor vehicle purchase and use in property transfer tax, it was consistent by month, uh, uh, more or less. I mean, some of the taxes come in quarterly, so you got little quarterly bumps, but it was across the board. And, and when we looked at the granular data in uh, uh, January, early January uh, from tax, uh, uh, was very broad based. Uh, so there is still a lot of uncertainty, but th that, that information shows the power of deficit spending at the, at the level that it's at. I mean, it's, it, it's really staggering. If, if you look just at what, was, what Vermont got, and Vermont got a, a disproportionate share per capita basis of the, of the pandemic relief money from, from the federal government, uh, among the highest per capita of, of any state. But if you look at that in, in aggregate, it's uh, about 20% of the total state economy, so total state output in, in, uh, uh, over the last 12 months. And there is probably more on the way. So we did this forecast uh, with a December control run from Moody's that we use as a baseline, which we modified, but we modified it in December before we knew the, the results of the uh, Georgia elections and uh, uh, before the uh, latest $920 billion uh, uh, rescue and relief measure was, was enacted, we, we thought that was likely, but not for sure. And then before there was um, consideration of what's now proposed at about 1.9 trillion, uh, still who knows what might happen to that, but the, the likelihood there will be further deficit spending both pandemic and uh, related and other uh, is is much higher than it was before. So I think you know that represents upside to what's happened. Uh, the the money's dropping in in a lot of different places in a lot of different ways and with really uncertain timing. So sometimes there's money that you know first it's appropriated, then you say, well, what's actually been dispersed, and then even what's dispersed may or may not ha actually have represented a whole lot of action on the ground uh, uh, yet. But it's, it's, all, it's all now a big part of what's happening in the economy and what's happening to revenues. And it's the reason for the, the radical upgrade in revenues that we've seen. Uh, uh, and, and I believe there's, there's still upside. The, the risks have to do with the pandemic, the course of the pandemic and with potential uh, refunding in the filing season. So uh, there are still some uh, uh, outstanding refunding issues that, that depending on how things play out and it's complex, 
uh, there could be uh, and uh, could be more refunding than we're expecting. Although we've upped that a lot, so I believe it's a, a conservative number, even though it's a very high one. But um, w w all of this is still quite uncertain, and we'll be monitoring all these things monthly. I don't know if you know we'll need to do an interim uh, forecast update. I think we should have done one after the first quarter because you know, the guidance would have been very different. We're doing this for private sector uh, uh, clients on a, on a monthly basis. And, and there, it, it was clear, uh, uh, you know, ev even, even before uh, the first six months ended that, that things were much, much better. And uh, certainly there could have been some adjustment. We're not really set up in state government to, you know, to do that frequently, but uh, it, it, it may be that, uh, you know, that will change. We'll be looking at that month to month. Just in terms of the pandemic and the epidemiology, uh, the, the, the good news obviously has to do with the availability and rollout of vaccines that, uh, that, are, that are highly effective. And um, the rollout hasn't yet been what, what and I think anybody would have hoped, but it's, it's moving and their plans for it to accelerate. And uh, uh, you know, that's, that's the light at the end of the tunnel. And it's just that there's a lot of darkness between where we are now and the end of the tunnel that has to do with uh, current viral spread, which is higher than it's ever been and projected to get even higher, both at the national level and at the state level. And uh, I, uh, mutations that are creating viral strains that could be more transmissible. Uh, it appears to date that the vaccine's effective against the ones that are known, but that's still a bit of an open question. And then the question is, can herd immunity be reached before other mutations that may not uh, uh, be dealt with by the current uh, set of vaccines uh, create added problems or delays in uh, putting, putting the pandemic behind us. Um, I think some of the more conservative estimates by the Department of Financial Regulation and the uh, people that they're working with in, in tracking the, the path of the pandemic and, uh, and the vaccinations that are occurring in state and the like show something in late fall of this year as being uh, kind of an outside point that they think there might you know, we might be at, at herd immunity and, and some of this would start looking like it's in the rear view mirror, uh, but that's an open question. So, you know, stay tuned to all that. The, the roller coaster ride's not over and um, there, there could still be a lot that, that uh, changes with all that. There, there are a few charts and maps and things uh, in, in the first part of the handout, we have to do pandemic. Um, one of them is a uh, is a map of the United States that shows, you know, total cases and percent of population. And in so many of these maps, Vermont has been a standout. Uh, you'll you'll you know almost any metric you use in terms of the health outcomes and uh, and the like, Vermont is is at the top or close to the top. Uh, in the nation. There was a time in early November uh, that I had uh, was contemplating some travel uh, to the Southwest and um, I was checking, you know, travel restrictions and quarantining uh, in uh, uh, New Mexico. And they had this website, you know, with a map of the country of people coming from these states had to quarantine and, and people coming from states that they had painted red on the map had to quarantine. and painted green, didn't have to quarantine. And the map was entirely red, except for Vermont and Hawaii. Uh, and uh, it, it's, it sort of made you proud to be coming from a place that had dealt with uh, the healthcare side of it in a really competent way. And also a society that was responsive to that, such that you know, there really was a reaction to uh, the guidance and directives that came out. So we saw a drop in mobility in the early part of the pandemic in Vermont that was way lower than any of the surrounding states and almost any other 
place. And that really kept rates low early on. There are big economic dividends from that. And, and we've, we've seen that at the national level with nations that have controlled the, the pandemic and then had virtually no business impact. Uh, uh, you know, Taiwan will show growth year to year in, in output uh, in 2020. No disruption to manufacturing, uh, very little disruption to any business, and um, uh, virtually uh, nothing in the way of, of deaths and caseload. And uh, uh, the same the same in Vermont. We can't separate ourselves from the region or the rest of the country. There's a tremendous amount of commerce that goes back and forth, and we see that also in the mobility data. Uh, but uh, still the fact that Vermont was relatively good caused a lot of people to uh, come to the state and work remotely from the state. We haven't seen tax revenues from that group of people yet uh, because that, you know, that, that they won't file until the April filing season or whenever they choose to file that, that won't be due. And, and uh, nobody's paying estimated taxes from that group. But uh, th there's some upside from that. Uh, and also um, uh, there's certainly anecdotal evidence that there's been uh, some permanent in migration that's been associated with Vermont uh, uh, being a relatively safe place to be. And, uh, but for widespread broadband access, it would have been even more, um, there would be more benefit uh, I know I'm a broken record on this for, th for those of you that are in economic development committees and the rest, but, but broadband, the importance of broadband has really been underscored by the pandemic and uh, the, the um, uh, remote workers and the capacity to work remotely, I think will be uh, a much more longer lasting aspect of the pandemic, even after the pandemic's gone, I think there'll be a lot more remote working that happens and that is, is potentially of great benefit to Vermont. Uh, so, um, you know, there, there are silver linings. And as you said, Anne, there, there are definitely winners and losers. And uh, that's a way we can make the state more of a winner. Um, so there's, there's a lot in the report we can touch on. The bottom line with revenues is, um, is a uh, revenue table on page 19. And uh, that just sort of shows what the change in revenue expectations were from August. And then below it, a pre-pandemic comparison with where we are now relative to the pre-pandemic January 2020 uh, forecast. Uh, it doesn't seem like just a year ago that this happened, but uh, you know, this time last year, very few people were talking about a pandemic being, you know, would occupy our, our lives. But um, uh, so relative to August, things are way up uh, uh, because of the impacts of the, the federal deficit spending. And uh, uh, general fund is about $160 million up in fiscal 21, 155 in 22. That recedes in 23 and 24, but is is not uh, 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 zero. So there are some lasting impacts from that much deficit spending that occur. The education fund also benefits uh, is is up considerably because of the the uh, uh, two large consumption taxes that are there: the sales and use tax and the portion of the motor vehicle purchase and use tax that go to to the uh, uh, ed fund. Uh, so that's also substantially up. And the transportation fund, even though it's up 16.4 million in 2021 and 9.4 in 2022, it's still a little bit below the uh, pre-pandemic forecast, about 13 million, as is the general fund in fiscal 21, is still 23 million below the year ago forecast. Um, but it, it does end up being higher in 22 and 23. And if there's another big tranche of federal deficit spending, 
either for pandemic or for uh, uh, other purposes, uh, that could raise uh, tax revenues going going out even further. Um, so that's kind of the that's kind of the takeaway from it. Um, there's a whole lot of more granular information we can talk about if there are areas. I think we'll turn it turn it over to Q and A and see if what what areas of interest you all have that you'd like to uh, ask questions about. Questions at this point. Um, Jane. Oh, me? Yeah. Okay. I can't hear you very well. Um, uh, I just want to. I got a quarter inch clearance here that makes all the difference on my mic. Uh, well, it's nice seeing all the uh, members of finance committee. I see um, some um, colleagues I haven't seen in a long time since Hazard Pay even. Um, one of the things I'd like to just reiterate uh, from a budget perspective, and that is the comment you made um, um, to relative to the general fund pre-pandemic. And I think with this, um, uh, when people look at it without looking at underneath it, I just, uh, for those of us who are working in the budget and keep reminding people that there's a difference between our base spending obligations and an infusion of one-time money that's not available. So I just wanna go back, cause you had made a comment. If we look at the general fund, even though it's up, it's still 27.4 million less than what was projected um, pre-pandemic in January, 2020. And really it looks like in, when we get through all this slug of federal money, for those of us who are gonna be on the budget committee in uh, fiscal 2023, uh, we're kind of back to where that spending and that revenue uh, challenge uh, you know, presents itself again. So um, for those of us who are making those financial decisions, um, I just wanna stress that, but if you would speak to the Ed Fund and what the impact that me needs be means, because um, certainly uh, finance and that uh, letter that went out uh, with what would be the proposed tax rate, property tax rate increase was um, of great concern and will be dramatically um, influenced by uh, these revised forecasts. So uh, could you speak to, obviously the, the sales tax is a big, big driver of how, how that Ed Fund is turned around. Yeah, I'll, I'll let uh, Steve uh, Steve Klein uh, uh, talk about how that filters through uh, to the um, uh, Ed Fund and the tax rate. Uh, Steve, are you on? Or Stephanie? He, Steve's or here. I see names. Or Stephanie. At least they're 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 on their call anyway. While, yeah. while we're waiting, while we're waiting for them, I'll just uh, reinforce what you said, uh, Jane. The the yeah, we're getting there. There are going to be two areas of kind of one-time things that are happening. So, one-time deficit spending that is pumping up the economy and generating elevated tax liabilities and and therefore tax revenue is one part of it, and that's what's showing up in these revenue forecasts. The other thing will be the opportunity with monies that flow through to the states or the states control in any way, shape, or form. Uh, uh, for spending that could be both pandemic related, but also impact economic development and other issues that, that the state would like to address. So there could be a once in a lifetime opportunity to have you know, potentially large chunks of money. And, and a lot of the money that came in first would have these crazy controls around them of you had to spend it really quickly and you know, and, and right away. So there wasn't the thoughtfulness that normally would have gone into an expenditure of that magnitude. I mean, if, if we had a $10, $10 million program that somebody cooked up and said they wanted to spend $10 million of state money, we'd, we'd analyze it to death and do options and figure out all these, you know, sorts of things. Here, like $200 million gets spent with an afternoon of commentary and, uh, you know, a couple phone calls. And so it, it certainly, um, you know, there, there will be more money coming both with this $920 billion uh, 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 recently approved act and, and probably more 
And so all of those, I think, are, are you know, have this sort of one-time consideration. Steve, are you on yet? Or, or somebody at Graham, do you want to address the uh, well, I see Graham and I see Stephanie. I, I can I can't address the the specific question about the education fund, but I've been told that uh, Catherine can, and she's in Senate Education right now, and so she can follow up with Senator Kitchell, or if she makes it back here in time. No, I I don't need it. I've got the sheet. Here's Steve. I, would, I want to yeah, I'm on Steve. too. Can, can we restate the question on the on the education fund? I'm yes, sorry. It, the, yes, uh, to um, talk to the committee about what these revised forecasts mean relative to that. Um, uh, Jan December letter that went out um, in terms of the nine cent property tax increase and what the revision will mean um, relative to mitigate that original right. um, uh, proposed increase. So I, let me just do that quickly. Um, so the answer is the education fund dollars are, are, were pretty traumatic. It basically eliminated the 58 million shortfall. So that is gone. Then, it, and that's of the FY21 money. Then 22 because of the money that was in, it also allowed 18 million to carry forward into 22. So the 22 money allowed the nine cent tax increase to drop to about 2.6 cents. Um, but uh, the, that's, and with 18 million in the bottom line. So you as a legislature will have to choose, do you take the extra one-time money and make that tax rate zero that increase or not? That'll be within the realm of area you can choose. So basically you're looking at no unfunded carry forward problem, 18 million in the bottom line, and a nine cent tax increase dropping to the two and a half, two point six cents with the option that you're gonna have an option of whether or not to eliminate it totally. Thank you. That's what this I thought was important for people to, uh, mm -hmm. uh, to have uh, presented in terms of the interrelationship between this and, the, and that letter. The other Sorry, point I'm unable was to, this, I'm in, oh, I'm Okay, I've got Sandra Sears, but this was, um, in all probability, one-time money. No, um, no, it's actually this, the upgrade and Tom can speak to this, but if you look in his out years, it may not be quite as high in the next subsequent years, but most of that is ongoing. I don't know if Tom, you want to, did you look at your 20? Oh, cause 30? that's. Yeah, no, okay. it, it, it recedes, uh, you know, in, in the out years, but it's still non-trivial. I mean, for the education fund, compared to pre-pandemic, it ends up being about 18, 19 million dollars more uh, uh, per year, longer term. But it's uh, uh, the big swing is between the August forecast and the and the current one, and that's very substantial for two fiscal years, and it gets cut in about half uh, after that. And so, just yes. a notion about the 23 on. That's why you're gonna to have to decide what to do with the 18 million because you'll have to take into account what's happening with grand list growth, what's happening with revenues in 23 and where do you wanna put yourself in that out year? And that's why it's up to you to figure out how you wanna address and, and Steve, two points. Steve, can you speak to, in FY22, that assumes the normal cost change as well. The, the FY22 number includes all expenses that are currently attributable to the fund, including the 36, $37 million change to the pension obligation. That's all covered. I've got Senator Sears and then Senator Starr and Senator Bray. My, my question, Tom, has to do with, well, I've got a couple of questions. One of them is the chart on page 12 of the unemployment. And I would note that Bennington and Rutland counties, and it looks like the kingdom are all the worst um, unemployment in terms of unemployment. Mm -hmm. um, but Bennington and Rutland are very similar to their New York counterparts. I'm, this leads me to the question that I had being a member of Joint Fiscal Committee, and that's where do we target money to those that need it the most rather than just some kind of a formula that doesn't seem to take into account the actual losses of that business or that individual. Um, I have a feeling that some people did very well during the pandemic, grocery store owners for one, um, but others, you know, were horrifically hit like the hospitality industry. 
second part of my question is on the property transfer tax increase. Looks like certain towns, you know, and particularly in my district and the Wyndham County district were the ones who had the highest increases. And I'm curious if what impacts those will have down the road on those communities. So those are that's a three, I guess, three part question. Yeah, so um, yeah, the unemployment rates have fluctuated a lot, uh, both statewide and uh, by county. If you look at the chart uh, preceding that on page 11, uh, it, it shows by state unemployment rates in pre-pandemic in February of 20, and then in uh, uh, April, and then again in November, which is the, is the latest observation at the state level. So right now, Vermont has the lowest unemployment rate in the nation, and it and it was pretty close to the lowest uh, in February before, but it spiked all the way above 16%, almost 17% in between. Um, but the way unemployment is measured uh, for, it, you know, sort of doesn't contemplate something like a pandemic being the cause of unemployment. Uh, so if somebody's staying home, uh, you know, because they have to take care of a child or teach a child uh, or care for someone who's ill or, or is concerned not going to work or not looking for work because of health concerns related to the pandemic, they end up showing up as not being in the labor force and therefore not being unemployed. And so, you know, it's a, it's a metric that is that doesn't have the same meaning. It's still better to have a low unemployment rate than a high unemployment rate. And this speaks, you know, well in general of the state, but it's uh, the, the variations right now are, are really uh, uh, difficult to sort of base regional policy on. That said, there are parts of the state that are perennial laggards in terms of economic growth and economic development. And to the extent you can focus uh, uh, development programs that help those parts of the state, uh, they're, they're going to be better off. And uh, th that does sort of tie in to your question about property transfer tax revenues and the impact in certain towns. Uh, uh, so there, there, there has been a, a fairly substantial uh, uh, surge in, in uh property uh, uh, purchases, property sales, transactions. Uh, but the number of transactions, and th this is now uh, the data on page 22, which is a, a, a table that's sort of uh, uh, showing the top towns in terms of growth, uh, is based on a 12 month period ending in December, 2020. So calendar 2020 versus calendar 2019. So this includes the pandemic period in the 2020 data uh, and everything beyond the pandemic. So initially property transfer activity dropped sharply during the pandemic because they couldn't get people out to do house inspections and, and lawyers almost always do closing stuff in person and that was hard to do. And so there weren't a lot of transactions right away, but then they just went through the roof. So we've, we've seen about a 33% increase in the value of property uh, uh, transfer tax revenues, the value of the, the properties that are sold, but actually fewer transactions. So about half a percent fewer transactions, which means the transactions that took place were higher value transactions. And uh, sometimes that would be skewed by, you know, a big non-residential project that might be in the mix because this is every kind of property here. But given the towns that we're looking at, uh, for the most part, that's not true. This is heavily residential, uh, which is true with building markets and other aspects of real estate that residential has been where all the, the action is. So the, the towns that have benefited uh, 
uh, heavily. I mean, you see the population, towns with big populations generally have more, you know, property transfer tax activity. So it's not a surprise that Burlington is at, at the top of the list. But what is a surprise is that so many other low population towns have growth in property transfer tax revenues that are comparable to Burlington. And if you, you know, numbers two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, you know, the, the, all the way down that list are, you know, towns that are in or near resorts and uh, places with recreational amenities. And uh, uh, that's been where a lot of the um, out of state interest in, in, in uh, home purchases has been. And, um, I, you know, if you get down to number 17, which is Barnard, you see the, the cumulative percentage of the growth that's represented by those towns. So the top 17 towns represent 50% of all the growth in property transfer tax uh, uh, revenue over that period. And the top 43 is 75% of all the growth. So if you've got uh, uh, decent broadband access, you can attract remote workers uh, just about anywhere. And, uh, you know, obviously these, these places that have a lot of high-end properties already, this wasn't, you know, th there's also been a, a, a big surge in new construction starts with single family starts, but they'd been depressed for a long time uh, and that takes longer. So the places that the high-end properties existed in were in those uh, uh, resort towns. That's where people wanted to go first. Um, and how many of those will be permanent is still an open question, but that, you know, that's one aspect of economic development to consider uh, and to consider with respect to uh, different parts of the state. Star next and then Senator Bray. Yes, uh, I was wondering, uh, Tom, if you or, or, or Steve, um, last year, if I remember right, <clears throat> we left uh, an increase in place that the communities actually voted and passed within their towns of a school tax increase. And I'm wondering if that has been looked at uh, because all the years that I served on our local boards up north here, um, I always kept the increase within a penny or two. And if there was a good year where money got left over for whatever reason, I carried it forward, but still left the school tax increase at a very low and modest rate. And you know, we used we did have a lot of problems with school budgets prior to that, but after using that method to keep the school tax uh, increases very low, uh, we never we never lost a school budget, and we built you know new buildings and bought new buses, and you know we we did very well, and so I'm wondering what would happen if we left the school tax increase at the rate that the town raised their spending and moved this money forward to offset increases into the future uh, to keep those, those increases very, very modest? It's Steve, I, I, I would just... Yeah, I was going to say that's exactly what you all are going to have to decide on. And I think that's going to be the work of uh, uh, Senate Finance and, and other committees to think about what, what you do with that $18 million surplus. Do you carry it forward like you talked about? You use some of it to keep the rate low? That's all in the level of the discussion you're going to have to have in the next few months. Yeah. Well, that makes sense to me as to keep the increases low, carry the money forward to help the next year and, and 
educate our children like they should be educated. The other thing that's floating around out there is that the schools are getting millions of dollars through the federal SR, ESSER two program, and we don't know what they're going to do with it. So it's not just our millions that are floating around. They've got millions floating around. Yeah. Put me on the list, Madam Chair. I, I've got Senator Bray. I just asked and then to Senator the Mc, Okay, now, Mark, then I've got you, and then I've got Senator Hardy. So where's Senator Bray? There he is. Did you put me on the list, Dan? I did. You're next. Oh, I'm next. Now? I saw your hand earlier. Oh, oh good. Um, <laughs> so, Tom, um, I have two. Think, no, oh. next as in after. Oh, after you. Oh, good. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Kovet. Um, so I wanted to follow up on earlier on, you were talking about risks uh, related to exposure to refunds. And I know we had a brief conversation in finance about PPP dollars arriving, not being treated as income, and then on top of that, also being treated as a deductible. I think that came out of the December HR 133 legislation. And so we didn't land anywhere on it, just noticing that it seemed peculiar to both have it not be taxable and then treat it as a deduction. So uh, I don't know the size of the exposure on just the PPP dollars. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and what other sorts of refunds are out there and to what degree like PPP, apparently the state of Vermont could depart from federal recommendations and, and not give the deductions. So uh, could you fill us in on that stuff a little bit? Yeah, um, there, there are actually a whole bunch of tax law changes that could impact uh, uh, both company balance sheets and tax liabilities. And it's, it's difficult to sort of play those out and, in a large scale. We have lists of the PPP recipients at, um, uh, at the high end, you have the name of the, above $150,000, you have the name of the recipient, and then you have a range of uh, value for the award. Below $150,000, you don't have the name of the recipient, you just have the town that they're in and the NAICS code that they're supposedly in to the extent that's accurately designated. Uh, and then you have the exact dollar amount of the award. So it's not like we can just line up tax filings of those entities with tax department data and say, what if we lost 100% of that? And what if we, you know, lost 50% of that? But what we did was we did go through um, I, I, a, a fairly large number of entities to look at uh, aggregate tax filings, you know, one by one. And in aggregate, it does not represent a great deal of money to the state. So uh, about half of the half of the PPP recipients uh, file as corporations, about half are pastors that end up in personal income. So um, it, it doesn't look like that is as big an issue as, um, as, we, as we initially thought, although we have put uh, added money into refunding in part because of that and in part because of concerns that uh, uh, tax year 2019, which you know, affected fiscal year 2020 revenue was really strong and estimated taxes are often set based on prior year uh, uh, performance. And so we felt there could be uh, uh, too much in the way of estimated tax uh, paid and there might be refunding from that. We also felt that there would be both corporations and individuals that might have a sudden decline in profitability and yet still have paid forward uh, for a while and be refunding. So we ramped up refunding based on that, but we're seeing even higher levels of both estimated and paid taxes. And uh, again, the, you know, there's a lot of information you don't get until 
the filing season starts. Uh, so, you know, there's no crystal ball into that. But from what we know now, uh, we think we've got a comfortable amount of, of uh, refunding in there. And there will still be a lot of revenue based on the fact that, you know, it's, it's, it's not just the initial receipt of the money, which was tax-free for PPP, it was not tax-free if you're getting unemployment insurance. Uh, you know, that's, that's taxable income. Um, and if you look at the withholding tax, you know, the, the largest withholding taxpayer right now is the Vermont Department of Labor. And that's not a situation that normally occurs. It's usually, you know, one of the big employers uh, uh, in the state. And um, so it's uh, the PPP money is not taxed when it comes in, but when it's spent, if you use it for payroll, for example, which is a fair amount of it's supposed to be used for payroll, then the money is taxable to the recipients of the pay that get the payroll, or if the company then, uh, you know, would have kept those people on anyway, and it's just getting a free ride with the money, and they spend it on anything else, then what they're spending it on often gives rise to a taxable event as well. So it's, you know, I can't say for sure, oh yeah, we've got plenty of uh, refund money in there. I'll still be, you know, we'll be on pins and needles in April um, and March, but um, uh, it's, it's, it's one of the issues that we've considered. Thank you. Donald. Um, Madam Chair, um, one, of, one of the, I had a couple, uh, I feel that we are racing ahead of um, the information that, that's gonna be made available. And I had a couple underlying questions and, and observation. Um, observation first was when money began to be the 1.2 billion began to be spent by us. Um, it was a remarkably um, uh, collegial and march forward and the various members of the appropriations committee based on their, their skills and abilities managed to give good presentations and the money went out. Um, that was last year. Um, this, there was plenty of loot to go around for everyone. This year, all the people that participated in, in that have been saying to themselves, um, when it comes to appropriations, what would I have done differently if I know today what I didn't know last year? So this round is gonna be much more um, educated, less cordial, and, um, and I would say sort of a, from the get-go, kind of a less sharing opportunity. It's gonna be, um, it's gonna be tougher. Um, the, what I hope to learn from Tom today was in this time of growing disparity between the well-to-do and those that are working to catch up, um, how has, have, have our citizens been affected by it? And what would he recommend that we look at to see that that disparity does not increase um, as a result of what we did last September and um, as what we're we were gonna do this year. Um, it seems we're already sort of trying to divide up and figure out where the money's gonna go. And finally, um, Tom's, what, Tom has been careful to say, uh, we don't know for sure. Um, we won't know until um, the data is not in yet. And I was wondering if uh, as money committees, we would have a recommendation on, or an understanding of when those questions would be answered so that um, it isn't divided up and it isn't spent before we get those answers. And that has something to do with how we might or might not schedule this legislative session between now and when we adjourn. So I would like to know that the, the growing gap between the, the haves and the have nots and whether or not this or spending to date has uh, made that a wider gap and what we might do about it when we find out what, what the money actually is. Yeah, so we have, we have the state spending, which was uh, 1.25 billion out of uh, uh, 
about five billion uh, total of, of, you know, to the extent that we can track by state uh, the flows. Um, but the um, so, so that's a part of it. So the 1.25 billion, the state had some uh, uh, control and say over uh, within the federal regulations that controlled that. And um, uh, I, I fully agree that it would be great to look back and say, you know, what what things really made sense and worked, and what things could have been better, and how we make them better. I wish that had been done at the federal government level too, because essentially what they've done with this next round is just the same old stuff they did the first time. Let's just do it again, you know. And there was a minor change to PPP. At least there, where there was some uh, uh, revenue loss requirement that was associated with it, but it was, uh, you know, it's 25% loss in one quarter. Uh, in 2020 versus 2019. That doesn't necessarily mean you lost income or profit. You could have had a situation where you had a bad quarter and then things took off. And that was true with a lot of companies, actually. Uh, you could also have had a quarter that you lost 25% in, in sales revenue and you brought your expenses down by at least 25% and you had no loss in profit. And then you carried on fine the rest of the year. It's, a, it's still a, a pretty low bar to clear in terms of targeting the money to the entities that need it most. And there are a lot of entities that were the hardest hit that didn't, you know, for, for whom it did not make sense to even apply to PPP because they didn't expect to have any employees or very few uh, for an extended period of time. And they've been proven right. Uh, you know, it's been a longer, wasn't just a three month event. So, you know, at, at, a, at a much larger, at a 30,000 foot level, there, you know, there's healthcare planning that's gone on around federal government response to a pandemic that's, that's pretty extensive. There, there are playbooks that have been developed around quarantining and, you know, communication and all the rest. There's no comparable economic playbook at the federal level that says, all right, if that's gonna happen in terms of the best uh, approach to healthcare, what do you do in terms of the economics? What's the best thing to do? And are, you know, do you use some old unemployment insurance system that's a state level thing with ancient computers and systems uh, and then try to funnel billions and trillions of dollars through this? Or do you just send out checks to everybody because you can't figure out who really needs them and who doesn't? Um, you know, you could have a much smarter approach to things uh, in all of these fields. And that hasn't been done at a federal level yet. Um, you know, even with the checks that are sent out, you have more money for the businesses and the people who are most affected if you target the, the, the relief. And not everybody needs another $600. Not everybody needed $1,200. Uh, there's some nonprofits I'm affiliated with that, that they're getting checks from people now for $600 because they say, hey, hey I just got $600, I don't need it here. You know, um, That's why the savings rate goes up. That's why uh, you know, Bitcoin purchases and gold purchases and day traders are trading like crazy. This is money where it's not needed. And so, you know, people don't do with it. Well, all right, that creates stimulus, but it's not targeted. It wastes money because, you know, there's more spent than needs to be spent. And if you just want a stimulus spending above and beyond the basic need, then that should be targeted things that give you great return on investment. That would be something like a national program to roll out broadband in rural areas like they did electricity uh, uh, you know, after the depression. Things like that that have a payback, not just send out checks to everybody. So you know, from an economic perspective, you know, the, if you send out checks and, and you're gonna do it indiscriminately, at least, um, you know, if it's not pandemic related in terms of the loss, and unemployment is clearly 
pandemic related. That's going to people that have lost their jobs. So, you know, that's fine. That's definitely targeted. But even with the other uh, checks that go out, if you made that progressive, if you ha had a lower cutoff uh, uh, or, or more with uh, families with children that are low income or, you know, situations like that, you could have uh, balanced some of the inequality that's occurring with, with this. I, I think that on balance, uh, this has increased inequality uh, the way the money's gone out <laughs> rather than reduced it. And it's not an easy thing just to turn that around, but those are some of the ways that it could have been done. At the state level, it's even harder to do. Um, so there are things, you know, that, that can help uh, level that we can be thoughtful about that to the extent we have discretionary money. Um, you know, so spending on things that provide equality of opportunity, like job retraining, there'll be some jobs that are not coming back. And uh, uh, so, so money for job retraining that's not rushed and hurry up and spend it in this semester because it's no good after December 31st, uh, you know, is not the way to do something like that. But if, if there could be uh, uh, that kind of spending, it helps both the educational institutions that are providing the training and it improves the, the output and productivity and opportunity for uh, Vermont workers who have lost jobs. Um, so anyway, there, there, there's a lot of, there'll be a lot of, of uh, policy options, joint fiscal and, and others can hopefully lay out and provide that, uh, that, that can aim things in, in that direction. Can um, I make a comment, um, Senator? Uh, yes, Jane. Um, just for the other um, committee members, we asked Tom uh, to speak uh, at Joint Fiscal to lay this out because there was a, a lot of concern around, particularly the grants for businesses. And the first rounds that went out, if you looked at where those grants went, it wasn't strategic at all. And we knew that, and this gets back to the comment Senator Sears was making earlier. And we were, um, it was, it was, a difficult process. We we really wanted to target. Um, we felt that um, the um, the need to do that, and and Tom provided, I thought, some very good uh, testimony. So I would say, if there's an area to look back, is uh, the way in which uh, those, particularly how some of those business grants um, were. Um, uh, administered. And what we were doing was, once again, simplicity on the state level, I guess, which is sort of the same as maybe what happened on the federal level. But I just wanted to reference back some of what uh, Tom is saying today with our efforts at Joint Fiscal to um, approve spending uh, for business grants, but do it in a way that we were providing the greatest relief um, to where it was needed, where the impact had been um, experienced the most, and uh, that was a that was a very difficult and sometimes a bit uh, rancorous discussion um, about how how best to do it. And um, and in the governor's budget adjustment, there's ten million proposed from this general fund one time availability to go to business grants. So I think we need to take the experience that we've had last year and. Uh, take a hard look at, you know, how that money could best, is it targeted and is it in the best way? And so uh, I think we've got some work ahead that ties into what Senator McDonald is asking. And that is um, what did we learn and how can we apply it to make better decisions? But I, I've, uh, for those on joint fiscal, um, uh, we found uh, Tom's testimony and about the need, how to use the money, um, very helpful. Unfortunately, it didn't end up quite as yeah. <laughs> targeted as we yeah. hope, but- um, Madam Chair- We, for, we tried. Yeah. Okay. Um, Senator, Senator Kitchell and the Appropriations and Joint Fiscal did their damnedest on our behalf when we weren't here. And I'm not questioning or diminishing. I think they were heroes. They, they sometimes said no and they did the best they could, but we're not here. We are now here and We'd like to know from their advisor, Tom, um, how to 
give us a to give us a new playbook that we could all consider and then as we go forward um and we seem to be close to tempted to divide the money up right now and say you know where it should go i hope we would i hope Tom can tell us, give us a list of things that if we were trying to keep our, this disparity between the well-to-do and the other, the rest, what are the things we can do that would bring that, that, make that gap less wide? And what are things that we should avoid that will make the gap more wide in this environment? That, that would be one of the more helpful things. Thank you. Yeah, I think there were some, there were, there were a lot of time constraints around the you know, the last uh, uh, spending package. And I, I can certainly uh, understand that. Uh, it seemed like there still was time to make some adjustments, but I, I can understand why people uh, uh, resisted that. Uh, and I don't know what all the time constraints might be both on monies that may be flowing from uh, uh, already approved federal uh, programs, this latest uh, Relief and Rescue Act, and then a subsequent uh, package, which might be even larger. So, you know, we will have gotten about $5 billion from the, the initial 2020 tranche of things. We'll get probably about another $2 billion from the uh, uh, rescue and relief money. We can see about a billion and a half, and then uh, through PPP stuff and things like that, there'll be more. Now, you know, some of that's, we, there's some states saying, some of there's not. And then with a with a further uh, uh, tranche of if it if it is something like 1.9 trillion, that could be another three billion or so to the state. If if there's money that's less restricted, both in terms of time, use, uh, application, there's going to be a lot of opportunity for really remarkable once in a lifetime investments in in the state. And if there's not, if they're tying everybody's hands and has to be done a certain way, or whatever, then it's going to be much harder to do. So we'll, we'll certainly join fiscal, you know, is at your disposal to, to look at all that stuff and we'd be happy to do that. That's it for now. Senator Westman. Yeah, I was going to. Senator Westman has. Oh, but you're sorry. Okay. So, so Tom, um, um, first I have a comment. Your um, property transfer tax uh, revenue, if you had a, a column that said um, number of sales and volume, it would help me better understand within those communities how fast those increases do. Because when I look at Stowe, um, the average price has driven everyone that's local out of town and um, that, but my, my the um, second question is, or comment is rooms and meals and the high unemployment towns, um, uh, I think have a correlation because I think where you have high unemployment, you have a lot of people, um, a lot of people paying rooms and meals are off dramatically. But underneath that, and this is where my question lies, because Airbnb and VRBO and all of those um, online rental groups are up, can we separate out in the um, property transfer tax where those are coming from? Because I think for the traditional hotels and motels, um, it really looks dire to me given the fact that you would have VRBO and um, Airbnb up so much. Yeah, so you mean not property transfer tax, but in the meals and room tax. In the rooms separate. and meals tax, yeah. because that yeah. rooms and meals, even though it's all down dramatically and it's all in certain communities, within that too, if, if what there is left in rooms and meals is coming from those short-term or, or online rentals, it says that our traditional inns and um, and Doing even those worse. are are in a, a worse spot, and it helps me think about the question that Senator Sears asked earlier: Who's doing the worst, and who are, who are the people that were most 
in a position to lose room. Is there some way to drill down there? Yeah, yeah. Um, so in terms of reporting data on meals and rooms and, and just back on the property transfer tax stuff, I'll be happy to share with you that entire file because they're interesting things in that. And it goes back to, to 2018. So it's 2018, 19 and 20 data on number of transactions and the value of all transactions. And um, so, so that might also have some more interesting stuff you, you'd want to look at. In reporting um, meals and room tax revenues or even commenting on it, it's, you know, unlike e-commerce in the sales and use tax, where we can say um, uh, to the extent we've categorized things well enough, um, and that's not perfect, we can add all those up and say e-commerce represents this amount, and we could even, that could be reported monthly uh, uh, even, and, and we look at breakouts, you know. Um, in the case of meals and rooms, there are so few firms that comprise the online short-term rental market that you would run into probably, I mean, we can check with, with uh, the tax department and see, but I think you'd run into confidentiality issues about publishing data on that. Now, some of these companies like you know Airbnb will actually uh, send out press releases occasionally and say how much uh, you know, business they have in a state or how much, you know, they're paying in taxes or whatever. But um, generally speaking, if they're just a small number of taxpayers that are involved and it, you know, there are confidentiality issues that, that come up. And I think that would, that, that would probably be an issue uh, if there's anything, you know, very detailed statistically that was presented. But you know, it is clear from a lot of reporting, not so, just so, in Vermont. So I just would back up. So they're considered the taxpayer. You know, for example, I have an Airbnb. Um, and when I rent it, I sent the rent, rental rate. They don't. They, um, we, um, um, they charge the amount. And then they take the sales tax off the top and they relay the sales tax to the state. So that's considered them paying the sales tax and uh, not, meals and rooms acting tax. As, the, the and rooms. not acting as my agent. Yeah, the rooms tax is paid by Airbnb. So they're sort of like a marketplace, you know, so the same way like online marketplace type, uh, you know, entities pay. Uh, so yes, the, the tax payment comes from the, uh, uh, you know, from, from, from the marketplace like, you know, VRBO and Expedia. So, so it's VRBO, HomeAway, um, yep. Airbnb. So the tax department couldn't in one bucket say, um, um, this is from them and here are the more traditional places. I, you know, I, I I'd want to explore that with uh, Craig Volio and just see what kind of a report we could issue that would give you the information you need without uh, uh, running into confidentiality issues. Um, you know, I it it's it's so why the the reporting on the success of Airbnb type businesses in rural locations during the pandemic. Uh, has been widespread. So it's not just a, you know, a, a Vermont thing. And so I think, you know, your deduction is correct and obvious just from that information. Uh, whether we could generate, you know, I, I'm not, I, I'll, I'll talk, I'll bring this up with tax and see if there's some kind of a report we could generate that would give you information that would show kind of, you know, the percent decline in everything, you know, that might be the way to do it would be to not report on that part of it, but just, you know, have everybody else uh, and then do some percent change kind of stats. And you could compare that with the other percent change data and, and you know, understand better what's happening to the traditional uh, hotels, motels and places of accommodation. Yeah, because when I look in communities like um, Stowe and like 
the community I live in. And when I look down through that, the Manchester's, the Mad River Valley, I'm not so worried about people in short-term rentals. I think those places are going to be okay. They are. Um, but I think the main streets in those communities can, will be devastated. And, um, and I, we really need some way to drill down to find out the information about those, what, what the main street looks like in those communities. Yeah, well, I'd be happy to, to, to work with you and tax to try to figure out a way to, to get you information that would be relevant to that. And, and uh, your, certainly your sensibility about that is correct. So it's just a question of what numbers, you know, a, apply to that. Um, you know, certainly, you know, when you're talking about assistance, you can then look at, you know, things like profitability and sales and certainly in the, you know, in the room side of things, when in the meals and room tax in general, and there's a, you know, there's a chart on total meals and rooms tax revenues on page 23. And, and this is like uh, uh, seasonally adjusted monthly data. You don't normally see the tax revenues reported this way, but this is the way we analyze them uh, is, is just like uh, government statistics. We have uh, uh, programs that, that uh, calculate seasonality and then adjust for it. And then we express it in annual rates. But you'll see, you know, this cliff that occurs, uh, you know, with the pandemic and, uh, and then just how, you know, so it's about a 40% drop. We're looking at levels of revenue that, that we got 15 years ago for all meals and rooms. And, uh, and it's also been pretty much dead in the water since that drop. It hasn't, you know, there's no, no, we're not talking about a V-shaped recovery or U-shaped recovery. This is an L. It's gone down and it's just stayed down. And so it's, um, it's distressing. And, and if you take out meals, that's the best part of it because meals has dealt better with it than, than the rooms, obviously. And then if you look at the part of the rooms that's not the short-term online market, you know, that's the part that's really been hurting. And alcohol is also way down. So the bars are down, but the room's part of it that's not, uh, uh, you know, short-term. Again, we say short-term online rental, but one of the other characteristics during the pandemic is there've been longer-term rentals. So people have wanted to use Airbnb type places as, uh, you know, remote working locations. And sort of like instantly having a second home. So, you know, that's another feature of, of what's happening. Um, yeah. So, um, Senator Bray. Okay, and then. Okay. The ah, well, it's all right. I had Senator Hardy. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't see Senator Westman, so I thought you were seating. So yeah. I've got no, Senator was... Hardy, then Senator Kitchell, then Senator Bray. Thank you, Thank you. Senator Cummings. Um, I, I first want to just make a comment about something you said, Tom, about how the federal government had a plan for the healthcare response to the pandemic and that that was so much better than their economic plan to the uh, response to the pandemic. And if that is the case, <laughs> that is even more pathetic because their healthcare response to the pandemic was horrific. Um, so yeah, the, uh, the execution, so yeah, the execution of the plan was horrific, but there was a plan. There's working groups in, in the federal government that were disbanded before the pandemic whose job it was to do pandemic planning. And, you know, all over the world, you know, there are pandemic plans. So it was very poorly executed and, you know, all that, but at least there was a plan. There was nothing equivalent in the economic world, but go ahead, I'm sorry. Right, right, yeah, no, I mean, th there may have been a plan for the healthcare response, but they threw it out the window immediately yeah. and, or ignored it. Um, so that just isn't indicative of how bad just across the board, everything was. And the other comment I wanted to make, and then I do have a question, is that, you know, in terms of our ability, the state's ability um, as state, the state legislature to target the federal money that we got of the 
$6.5 billion, or was it 5 billion total, we only had 25% of it in our sort of coffers to, to direct. And so much of that had to go to the immediate pandemic response that we had less at our disposal to sort of target to economic Absolutely. recovery. And hopefully moving forward, we can focus more on economic recovery as we move out of the pandemic. Although it seems like this m recent round that was uh, allocated at the end of December by the feds um, is less flexible. We, we may have fewer options in terms of how we're allowed to spend it. Um, so I guess it just sort of depends on the next, the sort of Biden plan moving forward as to how much, how much flexibility we'll have. But those were my comments. But my question goes back to something I think you said in response to Senator Starr regarding um, the education fund. Um, and you made a comment about the teacher pension situation and how the estimates took into consideration the teacher pension payments. And I'm wondering if that is true for the sort of long-term pension payment payments or just this year and how your report interacts potentially um, with the recent proposal the treasurer made regarding the pension <laughs> program. Um, and maybe that's a question for her, but it, it seems to me that we didn't get enough good news that we're just taking care of that problem. Is, is that correct? <laughs> yeah, I think it might've been Steve that had yeah. mentioned something about okay. pensions. Okay, uh, so I can talk about that separately, but go ahead, Steve. Yeah, so I would just say, yeah, so the um, normal cost is already covered in the Ed Fund for this year, and it, normal cost should not go up that stunningly in the next few years. So that's, but the, you raised the right point. Um, one thing that the pension problem is, a, is in part due to the whole pandemic where we, um, the returns last year were terrible and they're in the 4% range when we, the assumption was seven. There's nothing to help with that. And so, in a sense, when you one of the things that we are looking for in the new uh, relief would be revenue, uh, the ability to use some of the money for the state expenses, and maybe that could be helpful there. But the pension plan is um, remains a very major issue for us to face in the years ahead. And it, uh, while it, it may not be as much of an issue for the Ed Fund in the short term, um, for the general fund, it, it's pretty overwhelming. And the secondary is it doesn't do anything for the OPEB requirements, which really are uh, a big part of both. So you, you're correct on that. Okay, great. I just want to clarify. Uh, I don't know if Tom, you wanted to add anything on that at all. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, I mean, all I'd add is that the, the pension problem in the first place goes back to much uh, more mortal sins than the recent, uh, you know, issues that we have venial sins, but the, uh, the you know, the, the absence of, of, uh, of, of a forecasting process that looked at ranges, did alternative simulations, and then did true ups on a, on a, a timely regular basis so that if some assumption that you made was being missed, that you could have a course correction early on, identify the problem and, and do a reset it, that didn't happen. And it just kept, it just kept these pie in the sky assumptions about what was gonna occur and then push the problem off into the future. And now it's, you know, yours to deal with, but that, that is a problem, you know, a process problem that, um, you know, it hopefully doesn't get repeated, but, uh, you know, again, you, you have to have scenarios that don't always assume that you know, things are gonna be like they were before uh, and that you make adjustments if there's something that's, that's, uh, that's off with it early on. So it doesn't just, you know, uh, accumulate as, a, as an issue. Absolutely, thank you. Okay, I had Senator Kitchell, Senator Bray, and now Senator Brock. Yeah, um, I think it, well, we need to be clear is in, um, we are assuming the new ADEC of the 38 million, which was a fairly substantial increase um, to, as a result of a whole lot of factors. And that's an ongoing cost, but, and normal for normal. So the general fund is still covering all that uh, underfunding 
um, and that um, that um, is separate and apart from just paying the annual ADEC um, amount. But the question I have, um, Tom, and it goes back to the targeting of businesses and this new um, new bill that just got passed. Um, half of it is not coming through the state at all in the form of block grants or whatever or pro, um, uh, to be appropriated or um, whatever. Um, a lot of it's business relief. Have you had a chance to look at um, how um, you see what's in that bill relative to the experience that we've just had with um, just um, putting money out? Um, some people, we heard anecdotes that some businesses are doing so well, they were prepaying their rent and their you know, accountants were saying there was just a lot of money that went to places it didn't need to go. Do you see that the bill that um, has just been passed and what it's doing for businesses is going to uh, replicate that because we've heard some businesses are being left out. Can you give us a sense of, of what you see um, um, is in that bill relative to our business um, community? Um, I, I haven't spent a lot of time with the bill. You know, we've been full tilt doing you know, analyzing revenues and looking at all this granular tax data and, you know, yeah. lead up to uh -huh. this. So that's been, that's been 15 hours a day for a while, but <laughs> yeah. the, um, the, the, you know, the, the broad, some <clears throat> of the big spending initiatives, you know, basically repeat PPP, but have a, uh, a you know, a fairly tame hurdle, at least as a hurdle that there was really <laughs> no meaningful hurdle before. Um, so a little bit of a hurdle. But again, sending out six hundred dollars to everybody is not is not targeting, you know. So those two big things, so those two big parts of it, are not well targeted. Um, maybe uh, uh, Steve uh, or somebody from Joint Fiscal would like to comment on any other aspect of it if they've looked at it more closely. I think we'll be waiting more for the next, if, if there's an next tranche or whatever's in the next tranche. I think it's something is likely, but who knows what size it'll be, um, that, that maybe is both more flexible for states. And, uh, uh, and if there is additional money more targeted, but again, they're talking about another $1,400 and just send it out to everybody. And that's, that's not optimal as from an economic perspective that's not optimal. Steve do you have anything to say about the details of the other bill or Graham or? Well I mean not I mean not too much I think we're really a long way from that seeing that bill become a reality um there's a lot of, a lot no, of the one that's passed it. though the one that yeah. passed yeah yeah so I would just hold off till that till we know more because because Joyce Manchester did do uh a, a breakout, I think, of, of the uh, $920 billion uh, mm -hmm. measure, uh, Rescue and Relief Act. So yeah. any, anything else in that that, that you see relevant to? Well, I, I think that, you know, it, that we've discussed that bill before. There's going to be, that bill is very, uh, has a lot of um, obligations. I mean, and one of which you're already, uh, the committee is already dealing with is the vendor assistance, where, where it's a lot of money in a short time. Uh, yeah, I don't know that there's anything I'd, I'd have to add right now. Okay. Ray and then Senator Brock. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. I wanted to double back to um, what Senator McDonald was talking about a little bit. I mean, um, the consciousness that we have about uh, we're all in this together, but really actually not everyone is coming out of this together in the same way and how can we minimize the disparities and maybe even equalize things a little bit through targeted help um, with we so I'm wondering about uh, uh, investments that will be more than a cash injection for the near term and how suitable they do or do not seem to you and one of the things that we're working on in natural resources and energy is to improve our weatherization program because there's plenty of data that shows investments there save people money you know for the lifetime of that home and uh, that particularly for lower income Vermonters they already suffer you know a higher energy burden 
where they may be spending up to 20% of their money just buying energy products of one sort or another. And so is that uh, too slow, the kind of investment to make to be considered as part of a recovery program and for these kinds of dollars? Uh, does that seem like a stretch or does that seem like, no, actually that's a decent idea because when you make that kind of investment, you hire people, you train them, they do the installation and then the beneficiaries have benefits for years and decades to come. So I, I'm just wondering about that kind of thing, especially with a target on low income weatherization. Yeah, well, I think in any place you can uh, spend on something that you think makes sense anyway to do, but can be brought under the umbrella of uh, the requirements of, of any of these tranches of federal money that come out can be really, really impactful. So there's some things like broadband that have been, you know, people wanted to do, and then clearly can sort of be connected to it. The problem is usually timing, you know, how much you can do in a short period of time, and, and, and that's very limiting. So um, I, I'm not conversant with the exact legal requirements of the latest uh, uh, bill. Uh, and, uh, you know, maybe Steve or people at Ledge Council and other places can help craft things that would try to look at, you know, the exact language of the bill and what you can bring in under it and what you can't. Um, I, think it's, I, I think it's a great idea to try to do the things that make sense anyway that you know will have good returns. If you can use uh, you know, this kind of money for that, it frees up money that otherwise we're raising taxes to have to pay for. And, and that's, uh, you know, that's a huge benefit uh, to the state because you get the benefit of the investment and then you save money that you might've spent anyway uh, for that. Thank you. Okay, Senator Brock. Uh, Tom, I wonder if we could go back to the commentary that you had about uh, warning signals uh, that our pension fund was perhaps going off the rails. Uh, I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit about what were some of the warning signs along the way uh, and how uh, uh, reaction by the legislature could have changed the, the trajectory. And secondly, uh, if you have any commentary about your view of the adequacy of the annual rates of return that we are even now projecting. Yeah, I think that's really what it goes down to is what do you assume the rate of return is gonna be? And, you know, just looking at past information isn't, you know, isn't the way to do that. So you have to run alternative scenarios. First of all, you have to have one that says, if everything goes like we think probably it will, here's kind of the path we expect. And so this is reasonable. And then you probably want to be a little bit conservative on that and say, all right, the one we're going to actually use is a little bit below even the one that we think is most likely. Because if we have an error, it's better to have a little bit more than, than, than to be under. But when it starts to become clear to you that, you know, okay, we missed that year, or we're in a pandemic and guess what? You know, interest rates are now zero and uh, we're in a different world, then, you know, if you've run scenarios that had, you know, different ranges, you would, you know, you, you would recognize, okay, something's different and you act quickly. The, the, the magnitude of the problem now goes back to earlier misses where the, the assumptions were just either they're willfully Pollyanna-ish, and I was involved in them, and I'm, you know, I, I, I participate in, in uh, Capital Debt Affordability Advisory Committee now, but um, I, I was not involved in any of the uh, uh, earlier pension fund uh, analysis or work. But, uh, you know, that's essentially what a forecasting, the purpose of forecasting is and why you would run alternative scenarios and, and then frequently check in and say, are we right? You know, is it on the same path? And what could go wrong? And, you know, maybe there's a range. So, uh, yeah, that, that's all. To follow up on that, Tom, uh, and Senator Brock's question, uh, we raised that question about, uh, we have a five-year <laughs> period, and I, I raised the question, isn't that too long a period of time um, 
to not make, um, to recalibrate um, and check out assumptions. Um, I realize a year may be too, too little, you know, because of things needing to smooth out. But, um, you know, we were talking about three or something, but five years, if you're underfunding and your assumptions um, aren't panning out, you are accruing a lot of uh, obligation, liability, until you come in and um, true up. And frankly, right now, all of that, uh, all of those, all that unfunded liability uh, that with that truing up is falling to the general fund. Yeah. And, and, and so th the, the education fund, which now the ADEC has been readjusted to 38, and I never could understand why it went down from six to into the uh, seven million to the six million and went in back in 13, it was 11 million. And so um, it, it just, I, um, I guess I'm asking you um, or to expand a bit on your comment to Senator Brock about should we uh, with greater frequency be sort of recalibrating or um, uh, and, and it's five years really by the time it trues up, we've built up a tremendous amount of liability. Yeah, no, I, I think you should do a check in on at least not once a year, twice a year. And, you know, the pandemic shows how quickly an environment can change. You know, you're going along one way, all of a sudden something happens and there's a radical change in interest rates and interest rate expectations. And uh, so, you know, you have to do check-ins more frequently. It doesn't mean everything has to get revoted and redone, but there's a check-in and an opportunity if there's something significant that there can be an adjustment made. And that, that should be uh, uh, much more frequent. Hmm. Michael, and you're muted. I can hear, I, I, didn't, I didn't know I was recognized. Sorry, maybe I'm coming into this conversation late, but is it mostly the interest rate assumptions that's driving the debt, because I remember it seems, I can st still see the picture of Jeb Spaulding and the NEA, and I think the VSEA and the Cedar Creek Room announcing this great uh, compromise where everybody was giving something to fix the pension funds, uh, maybe 10 or 12, maybe longer ago, years, and since that time, when it was supposedly being there being a significant course correction, what has been the single largest factor that's made seems like the problem worse than it was even before the fix of a dozen years ago? Uh, I was I wasn't party to that fix, uh, nor I, have I been involved in the process uh, since then. It's only been. Uh, a year that uh, due to legislative uh, action that I was asked to be a non-voting member of CDAC. So uh, I can't really address that. Yeah, I would just say it's really the latest change is a mixture about half is the interest rate and half is demographic uh, adjustments. Um, people are living longer. Um, healthcare costs have changed. Um, there are a lot of factors that have gone into the demographics and that might be a, uh, worthwhile to bring in uh, Beth Pierce or the actuaries to talk about those two components. Um, any other questions at this point? There was one other thing, Anne, that was uh, uh, asked that um, I didn't respond to was uh, potentially some of the longer term impacts on the education fund from property tax uh, uh, appreciation. We don't do the, uh, you know, the education forecast is done in two different uh, places and times. So the property tax part of it's done in the in the fall, uh, you know, prior to the, the tax rate letter being issued. And then the parts of it that came from the, the former general fund and transportation fund are done regularly as part of this forecast. So the, the, the property tax part of it um, you know, moves much more slowly because it's an entire grand list. It's huge. So you don't get, you know, gigantic swings quickly. 
and their delays in the way that gets processed. But we're going into a period where there's going to be a lot more price appreciation uh, and, and price growth in real estate in general. That would have happened without the pandemic. And the pandemic's going to accelerate that somewhat. It's not going to be something immediate, but we're going to be seeing more grandless growth, uh, both through appreciation, um, a little bit of new construction, but it, we're in an unusual situation where we're going to be getting quite a bit of residential construction relative to prior expectations, but less non-residential. And, and that's unusual. Usually those two things move uh, uh, together and they're going to be going in opposite directions. So there will be some grand list impacts, but they're, they're quite a ways down the road. Um, and, and so far that's not, you know, that's not part of the planning that's been done. There's a little bit of adjustment done uh, back in October, but that's something else that we'll be looking into more. Okay. Further questions, discussion? Anything information you'd like as follow-up? Senator McDonald. Um, when, uh, when would uh, we likely have firm enough numbers to make um, decisions on spending vis-a-vis -vis additional government um, payments? I think I think that's you know more a function of of you know when uh, additional monies are coming in and Steve maybe you can speak to the flows from already approved but not dispersed funds um, in terms of timing. I mean the six hundred dollar checks have already gone out but I don't know about any anything more discretionary what the timing is on all that. Well, no, it's all over the map. So the money comes this month, and we're we're going to already be doing it. Some we'd hold it's ninety days away. Uh, it's it's and some a lot of the money is coming. Like the broadband is going to be kept at the the administration is going to run that through companies. Uh, there, it's it's really quite a uh, you know one of the really differences in this new bill from the the CRF bill, the last one was there we got a big tranche of money, one point two five billion within thirty days of the passage of the act. Here, every section is its own world and the administration of each section is different. Um, and we will be getting the education money, a good chunk of that right up front. Um, we're, the language says we send some of that out to schools, but there's no time in that. So it's, it's uh, we're gonna require a lot of staff sort of, and a lot of legislators looking in their own areas and their own sort of focus and trying to identify what's going on in that particular line of funding. It's, it's, it's just not as clean and, um, Every every section has its own. Some of the money comes through existing lines, like transportation. Um, it, there's not a whole new appropriation. Rental assistance is through a separate appropriation. A lot of the HS money is through existing lines. So it's very it's a lot a collection of a lot of different components. Steve, because of all of, because of all the things that Steve just said, my question was: When will we know the answers to all those things so we can make decisions? So. We're, we're starting to make decisions now in transportation, for example, and the budget adjustment, I think is 1.6 million out of that um, block grant of 50.4 million, which I, we were told this morning, a notice had been received. Um, that goes through the same CFDA account um, and therefore flows directly to the department, uh, to the agency to be appropriated. So I think the challenge is there's so many multiple avenues that, that the portion that comes through the state um, uh, is going to take. But in transportation, some of that money, in fact, the uh, award um, came in, I think, today. And I think that for the housing, the 200 million, um, there's a, a date for that to be available to the state as well, Steve. Do you remember yeah. the date on that? Um, It'll be the I 26 think, is the first 55 percent will come in. Right. Okay. Right. Steve, is there money in the new bill, the federal bill, um, for broadband? There, I thought I'd there heard are, there really wasn't. Yeah. There. Well, the fifty dollars. There is a fifty dollar a month um, payment okay. for broadband, but that's going to be administered as I and I heard this this morning. That's going to come in through the companies. Through you know, they're going to offer that. 
they're often working through companies to come and offer it to their clients, uh, which I really haven't seen that myself. So that's something that there. There's also in that bill some language that says three hundred million dollars for rural broadband, mm -hmm. well, and I don't know anything about that. I don't know where that goes, but it's something we need to afford to figure out. And and everything is administered by different agencies of the of the federal government, and coming in on different time scales. And uh, I would say we need to like that's an example. We need to find that out. And um, uh, we've got people, I think, but I'm trying to schedule next week mm -hmm. to come in and talk to us about those lifeline yeah. programs that the companies put out that the state and deadlines and all the rest yeah. of it because we don't yeah. know how many people are hooked up at this point yeah okay i've got senator ballant and then senator sears thank you senator cummings can you hear me okay mm -hmm. okay so Steve, just looking at the documents that legislators can refer to on uh, the website for Joint Fiscal Office, I know that there's a good breakdown uh, that NCSL put together section by section on this most re recent bill. And there's also um, another document um, that basically gives a division by division summary of the appropriations mm -hmm. provisions. Is there any other document that senators and you know, that we can look to, to get a breakdown, much to Ann's question, like what's in it for broadband? What's in it for these particular targeted areas that each of us are, are keeping a watchful eye on? Anything else there on joint fiscal we can look at? You know, um, we're, nothing else on joint fiscal's website. We, are, we need to, like today, there was testimony on AHS. Uh, Sarah Clark testified in, in House uh, and Senate uh, Health and Welfare and uh, healthcare committees, and she gave us a PowerPoint which talked about some of the money coming into her. But even in that PowerPoint, there were big, you know, hundred million dollars is coming from administration. We don't know the Vermont share. So, okay. it, um, unfortunately, this is re you know when when the bill came passed on December twenty seventh, it's it's we're in a real time. Uh, we'll keep putting things up there, yeah. but um, I think it's something we're trying to figure out on a staff level, and also um, legislators have to just and the administration has to about how do we sort of get that information in these categories in a useful way so you can make decisions? Yeah. Um, a, a lot of it is going to be passed through, I think, in the AHS and uh, transportation where the departments are getting the money. It's going to come right through an existing line. And then the department, the um, committees are going to have to consider, you know, what do they do with the flexibility that they have? And so that's the that's the easier stuff. It's um, but it, it's it's not an easy situation. We will yeah. we will double our efforts to try to find out what's out there in the way of and, and stuff. And whenever you post something else, you guys are great about letting us know. I just will yeah. reiterate that so many senators are just hungry yeah. for information on, on how they can actualize this information in their committees of jurisdiction. So maybe we should adopt the practice, which we did on the off session, or just every time we post something new, just send a notice to all legislators that this just went up. Okay, good point. Okay. Senator Sears, right? I had you. Yeah, I, I think my mine's actually a follow up to Senator Ballant and Senator Sorok. And uh, Tom's comment about keeping track of what's going on. I'm frankly overwhelmed trying to deal with this through a Zoom method. Um, we all have our areas where we concentrate to some extent, but <clears throat> we have this a lot of misinformation too. Uh, and trying to pin down that misinformation that many of our constituents get. It's all uh, very difficult. So the more we can get information, even if we all don't get to read it. And um, Tom's idea of, of you know, re-looking at things in an interim period is, is a good one. I, I, I'm afraid we're in a situation where we're going by a calendar of when the legislature meets. This may not be the best time for the legislature to be meeting. It may be better, you know, two or three months from now when we have better information. Particularly what you said about the schools, Steve, that somebody said, schools are gonna get this, the schools are gonna get that. We don't know when they're getting it. Will they get it directly from the feds? Will they, you know, it be passed through, through DOE? How's this all gonna work? And then we're making decisions and they're making decisions at town meeting on March 2nd. 
completely without information about what the federal help's going to be. I think it uh, gets- you know, it, I, I would just respond that there's really almost no good time because the the renters uh, the rent subsidy money, if you don't spend it by September 30th, it goes to other states. And so uh, when we have a couple other revisions like that, where they have just said to us, you need to get it out there or, or you lose it. And uh, there's some of that in the education language too. So, but I think you're totally right. And this is something Senator McDonald made the point the other day, the numbers are changing all the time. You know, the regular, the rules are gonna change all the time like they did last time. Uh, and we may get more money in a new bill. So I, I think it's just the nature of the pandemic that we're, we're living in, an, uh, you know, the money's coming in a strange way, the, the needs are changing. Um, it's going to be that, that feeling of just constantly trying to keep up and, uh, yeah, I just don't know that you can really wait or you, we have a potential to lose a lot of dollars um, because of the way they did the bill. That's helpful, Steve, to know that um, can't wait, but maybe we... <laughs> it's awful. It's really bad. It's, yeah. Well, and doing it by Zoom is, makes it all the more difficult. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and we may have who, to do like we did before, and that is try to set up an alternative structure so we can make, which we use joint fiscal committee. We did, <laughs> we worked almost continuously um, um, because of um, the need to make decisions quickly, but didn't, couldn't make them at, you know, within the official session. Yeah. A senator I know from uh, Maryland sent a picture of, of his chamber from up above and they've all got plexiglass. They sit in plexiglass chairs surrounded by plexiglass so they can meet in person in the chamber. But the, uh, I think I'd take this. <laughs> yeah, so I'm not sure there's any good solution to this problem of Zoom. Uh, I, I can't see a committee room with plexiglass gauges without. <laughs> I, he didn't send a picture of the committee rooms, but the but the yeah. chamber is, is very elegant, you know, but the plexiglass is around every chair. <laughs> I don't know how they get in. Maybe from above they jump in. Uh, Senator Ballard. Yeah, just, you know, to speak to what Senator Sears was saying, I know a number of senators um, have talked to me about do we need to structure it similarly to uh, last session in that we work hard until some point in May, we take a break and then we have to conve reconvene. I don't think we have clarity on that yet, but certainly I welcome the input from everyone on this call. I, I want your best thinking about how this can work. Um, I'm, I'm really looking to the wisdom of all of you. Certainly I'm engaged with the speaker on this same question, which is what is the right schedule for us to keep uh, in order to spend this money the best way for Vermonters. So, I think the big unknown is what will be subsequent legislation from Washington. Mm -hmm. That, you know, that- Absolutely. Uh, because yeah. it seems like uh, there's going to be, if uh, at least the way they're describing it, money coming to um, cities and states um, to help with uh, the COVID. So um, I, I I hate, I, but this is, we shouldn't keep Tom with our lamentations about what we might be having to do over the, the summer. Uh, um, so um, I, I don't know, I, uh, I just an announcement for appropriations after we finish this joint session, we have to, um, uh, we have one item of business this afternoon. So just want to alert people. Um, and so I, I not sure whether we have more questions of Tom or logistically uh, whether finance is going to be meeting again um, after after we finish That's this. What session. I'm checking. <laughs> um, you know, attended now we have committee discussion on state finances, but I think given the schedule we've been keeping and it's now 318 that um, we just won't meet today unless the committee really feels like they need to, yeah. to talk. Um, it takes a while, even having been up to our eyeballs and joint fiscal in all of this for months, it still 
takes a while to process everything we've heard today. And, but, uh, Senator Starr. Bobby. Yeah, Bobby, you're, you're muted. muted. That, I was trying to make you all happy. You wouldn't have to listen to me. Uh, but anyways, <laughs> um, I'm wondering, do we, we have people that like Tom that come along and suggest um, uh, things to us and revenue coming and and uh, and does a good job at that. Do we have anyone that double checks? Because we have Klein that also comes along and then we have Tom backing in back of him. Do we have anybody in state government that checks on our, our finances as, in regards to are we getting the best deal possible on our investments so we're recouping the best interest rates uh, and things like that? Because, you know, this downgrading from seven and a half to seven and how our interest rates haven't done well to uh, keep up with the teacher's retirement, uh, you know, I don't know a lot about finances, but a little bit. And the last few years have been not that bad in making money on investments. And I, I mean, here we hear stories constantly about, you know, our, our poor, or we aren't doing that well with our investments. And, and I, I'm wondering if we have anybody looking after the people that are doing this to make sure it's being done properly and in our best interest. I know something, but I have a feeling Steve knows it. Well, I would just say the treasurer's office is really in charge with a lot of this. And they, you know, I would say basically they do a pretty good job, but I think you need to bring them in to talk about this question. We and did I, get some. Yeah. Uh, we did get some testimony yesterday from the new person at uh, Joint Fiscal, talking about, um, and maybe you can talk to this point, uh, Tom, that um, because of the um, sort of mix of investments that you have to have um, for retirement, uh, for pension funds, um, it's hard to equate the return you would get simply with equities with what you would have with this portfolio of investments, but. Um, that's been a, a topic of discussion, certainly in committee about what, it, what is a reasonable return assumption. Um, and, and then um, how, uh, how does the performance of our funds stack against that? And how are our funds performing compared to um, other, other um, pension yeah. funds around the country? Yeah, no, that's, worth, that's worth looking at. And you know, you've always got, uh, uh, risk and reward that are related. So, you know, generally speaking, you have pretty low tolerance for risk with something like a pension fund. So you're not gonna expect the, the highest returns, but uh, worth comparing, worth looking into and making sure that you're uh, competitive. I think most of that is outsourced um, uh, mm -hmm. by the treasurer, but best to have her and her staff come in and talk about that. Senator Bray, I saw you. Um, uh, more expert people than I have already spoken on this, so I'll, I'll pass. Just that, you know, in talking with the treasurer about returns, my study impression is that she's very risk averse. And, and you know, so I think sometimes our returns are more modest than the impression we get from reading general financial news. You know, whatever the returns are, it's just good to have, you know, simulations that allow and, and tracking that allows you to make adjustments if you're wrong, even if, you know, even if you're starting low, so you're not as far off, it's just good to make adjustments quickly. And maybe, maybe now they've got that going. I, I don't really know, but certainly in the past, that wasn't the case. Okay. Yeah. That, that isn't anything, Tom, that you look at, right? 
No, I don't. I don't look at that as now that I'm participating in CDAC, I can ask more questions and get information, but I'm not voting on it and I'm not advising on it. I'm just sort of some additional eyes and ears for the legislature on what's happening there, as is Steve Klein and Catherine Benham also sit in on those uh, those meetings. Okay. Well, final questions. Ah, you're in does, this, does the legislature have any votes on CDAC? No. None. And that, you know, that may be something you want to look at um, having, because right now, you know, it's one thing to be on a committee, but if you're not voting, you know, it's not like you have, you can, do, you know, you just ask questions and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, it seems like a huge amount of policy is dictated by their recommendations. And it seems that the legislature should, should have more power there. Well, we've see, certainly seen the um, uh, uh, recommendations in terms of um, bonding um, be reduced significantly um, as a result of the recommendations, which we've not altered from, so. Okay. Well, if we're finished, I'm going to ask appropriations I, to stay on. Okay, and we'll have finance. Um, and Faith, I see you're back on. Uh, you and I can talk, I guess, tomorrow at noon is if we're set, or you can right. give me a call. Thank you.